It's October. It's October. It's hell. It's October. It's October. Do you want a squishy fat controller? It's October. It's October. Ah, that's better. Can we at least get Halloween out of the way before shoving Christmas down our throats, planet Earth? Shh, kids, I'm coming for you. Yes, I know it's the Halloween special and we're not wearing a costume, but here's the thing guys, we just came out of a really nice, warm, long summer, especially for the UK. So you know what? Yeah, I'm gonna dress up all summery because god damn it, I'm gonna try and keep it alive! No, it's not quite the same, is it? I'll tell you what, I won't go extravagant or anything, I'll just get a little costume. I've gotta do something for a Halloween special, so um, I've got an idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a bit better. Anyway, today we're going to be covering the one and only, the unmistakable Resident Bloody Evil. The genre-defining survival horror classic. Now, I've been making videos on PS1 games ever since May 2012, so why on earth has it taken me until 2018's The Month of Terror? <laughs> For me to finally cover one of the biggest games on the system and one that helped cement big budget horror games from that point onwards? Well you see, much like with how long it took me to get to Silent Hill or even Toy Story 2, there are a few games from my childhood or teenage years that just meant that much to me that I honestly wasn't confident enough to dedicate a long time to script for it in order to make the best video I could. With me and my upload schedule for how big some of my video projects are, you need to wait for lightning to strike twice on an abandoned tractor tire in the middle of a desert for me to feel comfortable enough to jump on the chance to do a video out of the blue, and as luck would have it, I feel like I'm ready now with Resident Evil, so let's go, mother fungus! What can you say about this damn game that hasn't already been said? Well, I don't know, so I'll say it again, what do you want me to do? In the offices of Capcom in 1989, an already legendary video game designer known as Takoro Fujiwara was there to direct one of the first ever survival horror games of all time, Sweet Home for the Famicom, or the Japanese NES. But how the hell do you make this scary? <laughs> You don't. So for his next project, he wanted to produce another big survival horror adventure now he had basically established the groundwork years before Alone in the Dark came along. How was he going to make this next game truly terrifying though? By enlisting the help of a man known as Shinji Mikami. And he had just finished designing Goof Troop on the Super Nintendo, so he was clearly the perfect man for the job. But Fujiwara was smart about this, because he knew that Mikami was actually a total baby scaredy cat with wee wee in his poo poo pants, so who better to design a scary video game? I mean, Mikami could easily tell everyone what scared him because of his weak horror backbone. It was a genius decision, and a decision that would eventually morph into a game that would go through multiple redrafts and even got slated for an original release on the Super Nintendo, but once the power of the little grey toilet seat was unleashed to developers everywhere, the end result became the gory and intense 3D explorative horror roller coaster known simply as Resident Evil. Biohazard. Yeah, it's called Biohazard in Japan. The name was changed overseas because of stupid shit. Many online sources say it was because of a DOS game called Biohazard being released in the US sometime before it, but I couldn't find a thing about that game anywhere, and only Bio Menace, so if any of you can answer that riddle, be my guess. Either way, I love the title Resident Evil. It sounds way more imposing and invasive. Like, evil being in your own residence? That's a scary thought. And today, I'm replaying this game for what must be the umpteenth time, and I consider it a pleasure every single time I go back to it. I love this game to pieces, but to spice up my next playthrough a little bit, I decided to look online for a ROM of the uncut version of the game, which has content that I've never actually seen before. For instance, where the original FMV intro looked like this, <laughs> and this, Joseph! and th seriously, can you even see what the hell's going on? Because I can't. What's chasing us? Dinosaurs or some shit? Why is Jill laughing? Cut it out, Jill. This is a very serious matter. The uncut version of the game, on the other hand, looks like this. It's in colour for one thing, and you can actually see that this guy's hand holding the gun has been ripped off of a body instead of just looking like you've picked up the hand of a guy who fell asleep holding the gun. <gasps> But more importantly, check out all of these incredible practical gore effects. I can actually see that they're shotgunning rabid zombie dogs in their faces until their eyes drop out. This was one of the most badass surprises I've seen revisiting one of my favourite games, and why this wasn't included in the original runs of the game, I couldn't possibly tell you. Jesus Christ, Albert Wesker's hair is Pikachu yellow, yes! If you ask me, this would have made the game even more memorable and probably scarier for 1996 audiences. And yeah, you do need to remember that with the more cheesy horror aspects to this game, well, yeah, it's commonplace now, we've seen a lot worse, but Back in the day, this was actually kind of freaky stuff. This game came out at a time when no one had seen anything like this, especially in an interactive medium, so yeah, it may be very dated nowadays, but it is definitely a product of the time, and you just need to remember that. But hey, what's the story in Resident Evil exactly? Is it about an evil residence that comes alive and eats people? <laughs> no, the game is actually about a rescue operations team from the Raccoon City Police Department known as STARS, who sends out one of their divisions, Bravo Team, to investigate a gruesome series of murders in the Arclay Mountains. There are outlandish reports of families being attacked by a group of about 10 people. 
victims were apparently eaten. At least that's what the news says, but I'd be pretty skeptical myself. You see this news guy in Willy Wonka, his last name backwards is Leak. You wouldn't trust anyone with that name, would you? However, this all bollocks up as to be expected once their helicopter has an emergency crash landing in the middle of the woods with no responses back to HQ. So then Star's Alpha team get sent in to not only find Bravo team, but maybe even solve these cannibalistic killings in the meantime. Look at young little Chris Redfield's face there. That's a face that's ready to punch the piss out of the boulder. But of course, zombies happen, and your helicopter pilot, Brad, turns out he's a bit of an arsehole and decides to panic and leave you all in the woods once the chaos begins. No! Don't go! Yes, Chris. Just stand there slowly moving your hand down to your chest like an interpretive dancer. The remaining members of Alpha Team book it to the nearest sanctuary they can find, a totally not conspicuous and horrific old mansion, and figure out what to do from there now that Chris has gone missing. And it's at this point we get introduced to some of the greatest video game voice acting of all time. What is this? Wow. What a mansion! In a so bad it's good way, I mean. This voice acting is worse than naming your whiskey brand Knob Creek. And the voice acting throughout the whole thing isn't only terrible, but makes absolutely no sense half the time. What is it? That's a gunshot. How do you not know what a gunshot is? You're holding one there. It isn't a water pistol. See if you can find any other clues. I'll be examining this. But you don't have the tools needed to examine it. What the hell can you do with this blood? Stare at it. Let's search for him separately. I'll check the dining room again. But we just came from there two minutes ago and found nothing. Why the bloody hell are you going to go back? And furthermore, you aren't even in there when I follow you. What's your damage? Beats me. Well, hey, at least I can steal some ammo off of the corpse of my old friend that's buried in his groin. Oh, also, we slowly discover that a pharmaceutical company known as Umbrella may be involved with some of the experiments going on in this mansion in total secret, but as I'm sure you know, that doesn't stay secret for very long. Onto the gameplay though, how does one play Resident Evil? Well, the game itself is laid out in a five-act structure. You begin searching around the main mansion looking for a backdoor exit, which leads you to the mansion grounds and outdoor guardhouse, which nets you a special key to open more rooms in the mansion again, which then leads you to an underground cave segment finally capping off with a secret basement lab. This may be a linear series of events, but the gameplay within each of these segments is anything but linear. I mean, some areas are more linear than others, like the caves, but most of the time it's a fully explorable survival horror that lets you go, doesn't hold your hand, and lets you figure out how to find keys to open more doors to progress, with only the occasional safe room to stop you getting more to death 24-7. And when I say explore, well I mean if you have the appropriate keys, you can end up having to choose between three plus doors to enter, and new routes with most new keys that you grab. Not only great for replays, but just a cool choice left in your lap to test how confident you are with wandering around and seeing how everything fits together. If you aren't familiar with the term, survival horror games are a lot different from something like Amnesia The Dark Descent, which is just pure stealth first person horror. Survival horror places more emphasis on how good you are at item management and trying to decide in the moment what you should be using your weapon ammo and items on, hence the survival element. You can't just run around and gun everything down and you can't just heal whenever you want either. The combat itself isn't deep, you equip, point and shoot, but every single bullet counts and each shot can turn the tables for you later on in the game if stronger or faster enemies pop out from behind a corner. I like to look at the gunplay here almost like making a move in chess. It's more strategy over skill, you need to decide when to sacrifice your ammo and when to keep it for later, and the combat is merely there as a choice to even the odds instead of running around them, because sometimes you will need to do that if you aren't careful. Ammo itself along with the health items are not common whatsoever, with guns like the Magnum only letting you discover around 30 additional bullets in total throughout the whole game, and enemies can often take more than half a clip of your regular handgun ammo to take down. So often the best course of action is to actually run away from enemies if you feel it's safe enough to save tons of ammo for later, but then risk getting getting caught by one of the monsters on multiple treks through the same rooms, meaning that you have to use some first aid or herbs to stay alive. By the way, serious question for Americans, why do you call them herbs? Why is there a silent H there? What, do you live in an house? But this isn't the only dynamic at play here, because you have limited inventory slots, meaning that you have to think about every single thing you pick up. Do you collect that rare bit of ammo in case you find a giant creature, or do you leave it behind and grab later but risk getting killed because you didn't pick up that health earlier since you had too many key items on you? If you use the shotgun, you can either play with it safely and fire at enemies at point blank using a bit more ammo than usual, or wait for them to be so close to you they're practically breathing down your neck and then aim at their heads for a risky instant headshot kill. Or how about the herbs that you can heal yourself with? There's a lot of different mixtures you can make with green, red and blue herbs together. So do you pick this herb up and use it straight away to heal a little bit of health right now, or keep it and save it for later risking the chance to not grab an important key item later, or mix that herb with another herb nearby to save the space but give you a much bigger health item to lose just in case you need to waste it in order to pick up another item later because you can't drop items in 
items in this game unless you find an item box somewhere. This added amount of stress and strategic planning on your part is what makes every enemy encounter all the more tense because even if you sort out the ideal inventory set, there's still a chance you could end up missing all of your shots as you waste ammo or even get hit more than you were planning meaning more health should have been on you. And even worse, you can only save your progress via ink ribbons that are once again extremely limited and must be picked up in order to use at a typewriter that's closest to you, adding yet another thing to consider when picking up health, ammo or key items. You also have to pay attention to the zombies themselves because once you gun them down they could fall to the floor but if their blood doesn't start pouring out around them that means they're not dead yet. So if you run past them they're going to grab you making you lose a little bit of health or you can use a few more bullets to finish them off while they're on the floor. The choice is up to you and even the tiniest little mechanics like giving you a choice of whether or not you want to pick up an item or hit a switch. Even if there's no threat of anything going wrong when you hit this switch and you just need to turn a light on, it makes you think twice about what you're doing and second guess what your choice may or may not mean. Especially with the amount of traps in the mansion, you never know what's going to happen so that tiny extra little choice just makes you feel all the more stressed. By the way, if you die, it doesn't matter how far you got, you go all the way back to your last save. So do you use one of your limited saves now or do you save it for a little bit later in case you die? It's another choice left up to you. The more confident you are, the more you'll be able to get around with less ammo and health in your inventory to fall back on, meaning that you'll be able to grab key items a little bit quicker and get through the game a little bit faster, which means that Resident Evil above most survival horrors, even of recent times, creates a vivid connection between you and the areas you explore. Even Silent Hill didn't have this feature. The map is also very handy whenever you need it and whenever you find it hidden in one of the rooms in the first place, but I find myself never really using it since the game is so great at naturally pushing you to learn every single shortcut and layout of the mansion's rooms and surrounding areas, making all the backtracking once getting appropriate keys all the more easier and less life-threatening. Which you will be doing a lot, especially for your first playthrough, since figuring out the correct order of events and using correct items in relevant places of other rooms is a huge aspect to progression here. Whether it's the original Resi or even the GameCube remake, I never forget the best routes and where doors lead you because of how beautifully woven and connected the areas actually are, especially in the mansion. And hey, with the main mansion itself, clearly the most effort was put here and it really shows. And not just from how well it's designed and how much it feels like a big old house, but also with how the game nudges you towards learning it naturally to make the whole quest that much easier for you and more satisfying. Especially if you need to do a bit of item swapping in the occasional safe room and then head back to where you just were. There's even a mission in the game where you find another one of the missing team members who's been attacked by a terrible demon. Terrible demons. And in order to move the game along, you have to rush back to a safe room to get an antidote to come back. I mean, the guy dies anyway, so it's kind of pointless, but it's a good test of your knowledge of the mansion. Ouch! I suppose then it's really lucky that all the item boxes spread out all over the game work like this. Hello! <laughs> meaning that they're universal and keep the same items in them no matter where you are, which makes no sense, but I can't imagine how much more dull and annoying the game would be if it were any different, honestly. Now, there's something else you might have noticed as well. Even though Chris Redfield is on the front cover of this game, or at least I think it's Chris Redfield, it doesn't look anything like him, so it could be anybody, I don't know, it might as well be my dad. How come I'm playing as a girl, Jill Valentine? Well, you can actually choose who you play as at the very start of the game between Chris and Jill, and every time I pick, I go 80% of the time with Jill, because she's the better character to play as by a far margin. And when you put these two together side by side and judge them by their appearance and 90s media stereotyping, why is it that little Jill over here is way better to play as than big, burly man, muscly Chris Redfield over here. Because when you play as Jill, you'll be saying out loud to yourself, Whoa, man. You suck! Chris may be able to run a little faster and take a little more damage, and has another story mode with different character interactions for replay if you so desire, but Jill completely kicks his ass into orbit from having a lockpick at the start of the game that gets her through many locked doors and desks automatically without the need of small keys to find and take up inventory slots, and speaking of, she has an additional two slots to her inventory to boot. Which doesn't sound like too much, but in this game, inventory management is a huge component and the more space you have to play with, the better your experience will be. It's hard enough with eight slots, let alone Chris's pathetic six. He probably needs more space in his jacket for his rippling biceps. The only thing I'm not too fond of with Jill is her attitude to things. It's questionable to say the least. Nothing special. Eh? What? You mean the rows and rows of deadly virus capsules in front of you? Nothing useful. How could you possibly know that? Look how many chemicals there are. Read the labels. Nothing unusual. Are we looking around the same mansion here, you daft oblivious pest? All those things are niggles in the grand scheme of things, though, because the real reason you want to pick Jill is for her campaign story alongside one character in particular, and that is none other than Barry, bloody, buggering, bastarding, person. You saved me! Yeah. He's the best character ever put into a work of fiction. What is he like though? I mean, it's kind of hard to describe really. He's like, 
He's like... Mary, you're so optimistic. Is there something wrong with you, Jill? Barry alone makes Jill's campaign one of the most unforgettable experiences you'll ever have in a horror game. Actually, no, not just a horror game, a video game in general. Just listen to some of these porkers here. Here's a lockpick. It might be handy if you, the master of unlocking, take it with you. What? Okay, how the hell does someone become a master of unlocking? Unlocking what? Something's wrong with this house. Whoa. This hall is dangerous! Was something dangerous supposed to happen in the middle of that sentence? Because nothing did. And by the way, this is the safest hall in the whole game, so I don't know what you're talking about. What is it? Oh, you know, Barry, it's just that thing that ate one of your closest friends five minutes ago. But, you know, you can laugh about it, whatever. Now, Jill, can you go? I'm going with you. Chris is our old partner, you know. Honestly, it's just the delivery of that last line that really bugs me there. I mean, what is it with the whole granddad sitting on the rocking chair with his grandson on his knee, you know? I told you, don't worry. I'll just go and get some fresh air and be eaten by a monster. Well, that escalated quickly. It's a weapon. It's really powerful, especially against living things. As opposed to using a weapon against a dead thing. Oh my god. God. But I think we all know what everyone's favourite line is. A line so infamously shit that everyone knows it even if you've never played the game before. If you decide to pick up the shotgun on the wall here without replacing it with the wooden shotgun, you end up activating a trap in the next room. As Chris, this will kill you, but as Jill, as the ceiling is just about to come down on your head, Barry saves you at the last minute. Oh dear, are you stuck? Master of unlocking my ass! And in this near-death situation, with you being saved just before your untimely demise, Barry thinks it's more than appropriate to spout out this. That was too close. Close. You were almost a Jill sandwich. You know, when I was younger, I always used to think he said Jibble sandwich because of that little cough he does in the middle of the line, but it doesn't really matter, it's just as dumb as the original line, so whatever tickles your jibble. <laughs> You're right! The game also has light puzzle solving to access particular items or even optional goodies like health and brand new weapons, which is pretty damn light, honestly, and mostly revolve around pushing items around rooms in a 3D space in the correct way. But a few may catch you off guard, especially those puzzle rooms that may end up killing you if you rush through them without thinking, meaning that you have to go back to your last ink ribbon save. I tell you, you will not trust any single room in this game because of that. Observation and patience is as much a key to playing the game as quick fire decision making when things are out to kill you and it can make you very on edge when over an hour's worth of progress is hanging on by a thread and makes any puzzle, no matter how simple, memorable. Are the puzzle Silent Hill levels of good? No, not at all. But with everything else going on in this game, I really don't think they needed to be. They're just a nice little change of pace. What else adds to the tension? Well, the controls themselves. This game operates on tank controls, which means that no matter what direction your character is pointing on the screen relative to you, pressing up moves you up, left points you left, right points you right, you get the idea. People like to slag off this control style like nothing else and call it a bad stain of early 3D game design, but honestly I think it has its place in some games and Resi 1 is built perfectly around this control style with all the angular room designs and static fixed camera angles. It doesn't take long to get your bearings and once you start transitioning from one crazy camera angle to the next you'll be glad this has been implemented no matter what happens knowing that you don't have to constantly flip your button presses around depending on where the camera throws you to next is actually kind of smart and i can't say it's a restriction because of that i mean why do you think they kept this control style for the remake as late as 2002 not only that even when you get used to it this is what early silent hill and early resi were best at with that control style making you think twice for just an extra millisecond to add another layer of panic when you're being chased by a stronger enemy or need to dash around something else. Even if it's just for a microsecond, you second guess where you should be running, which direction you should be pointing, and where you should be pointing your gun, and that makes it all the more fun to figure out, and makes the combat all the more engaging. It adds to the atmosphere as much as anything you actually see on screen, and I love it. And hey, what about what you see in the game? I mean, okay, yeah, it has dated quite a lot since it first came out. It's not the best looking game out there, and especially compared to like Resident Evil 2, yeah, the game doesn't look as good, but it still does its job really well. It gives each room of the mansion, every environment, its own sense of identity. Most of the game is built around pre-rendered backgrounds that real-time 3D models are placed on top of, not only making for a very unique looking game, but was probably the most logical thing to do with the size of the environments and the amount of detail needed to make it feel like a real mansion. It also makes more sense with the fixed camera angles too, not only to hide away the 
the threats around every single corner to keep you on your toes, but to make sure they load quicker and look far more visually distinct from each other, making the backtracking a lot less monotonous and making the eventual choice of which door you want to enter with the correct key all the more exciting. You never know what secrets, traps and surprises lurk in each room, and the fact that they all have their own personal mood to them with the lighting and colours makes them all easier to remember in terms of positioning with the map. Also, I do absolutely adore the darkness and subtle, dimly lit corridors in the GameCube remake, but I equally feel like the bright, garish and ugly wallpapered walls are just as eerie. With all the light still blasting away, it's almost like you've intruded on this house during an important event. It's like you're right in the middle of the experiments that are happening all as you are there, and that's kind of freaky. The pre-rendered backdrops also help you distinguish where interactable objects, pickups and even secret doors are to give you hints on what you need to do in each room without them being way too obvious. But this thing on the wall in the garden area though, what is it? Why can't I pick it up? What, what is it? And hey, how can we talk about Resident Evil without talking about the door transitions? Probably the most effective and creepiest loading screen in gaming history. Every time you go up and down stairs, ladders, or through doors into another major section of the mansion, lab, or guardhouse, you get given the model of the door surrounded by a pitch black void, which then slowly clicks and creaks open to give you just a few seconds of stewing in your seat, wondering what could possibly be behind the door. And the more rusted and decrepit the door looks, the worse the feeling gets. And once the screen quickly fades back in from black after the door closes behind you to only throw a monster right in your face, you begin to distrust every single door in the game. You just never know what's on the other side and what could pop into the frame. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's only Jill. Still a pretty weird camera angle though. And don't forget, I'm talking about a loading screen, yet how the game masks it to make it a part of the survival experience is nuts. It's nuts. And these FMV clips that play throughout the major events of the game really add to the uneasiness simply from how jagged and uncanny they look after all these years, with my favourite being the one where the fastest and deadliest enemy in the game, the Hunter, is introduced. You come back from the guardhouse to explore the mansion again, only to see that something incredibly fast and vicious was behind you the entire time, dashing after you with deep throaty breathing and intense music backing it all up, and before you see the hunter in the flesh, you're left with this horrific image of a green scaly hand opening the door you just came in through. And yeah, it looks kind of shit, but that's what makes it so creepy. You don't know what it's gonna look like. And you can't forget one of the most standout and important FMV sequences in the whole game that's so iconic that most of the Resident Evil games after this would make a tradition of replicating it. The first ever zombie reveal. Now including a half-eaten head rolling on the floor in the uncut edition. <laughs> okay, it's pretty laughable nowadays, but at the time this was one of the scariest things anyone had ever seen. If you can believe that. Actually, I take it back. This was the scariest moment in gaming history at this point in time. And to make things worse, once you get over the whole OH MY GOD WHAT DO THE CONTROLS DO moment when you've been taken off guard, it happens again right after you survive the first encounter. Hang on a second. I was able to take down two rabid zombie dogs jumping in through the windows in a narrow corridor, but Wesker won't let us go back outside the front door of the mansion because we were chased into the mansion by those very same dogs. Don't open that door! In fact, we're more than okay to stay in this mansion while being eaten alive, gassed to death, sliced up by lizards, poisoned by giant spiders, but still refuse to go back outside the front door. The entire Resident Evil series wouldn't have happened if the characters just left through the same door that they first came in because that was the safest option. Who missed that oversight? By the way, wanna jam out to some of this music? Check it out. Okay, a lot of the game is just really quiet hallways with nothing but your echoing footsteps and distant groaning creatures to keep you company, but whenever music is used, it's completely incredible. Just listen to some of these pieces while looking at some of the visuals and you'll see what I mean. And the save room theme particularly stands out. It's the most peaceful and comforting piece in the game, yet is still unsettling as all hell to let you know that you aren't as safe as you think you are.
Fun fact! Did you know that the original composer for Resident Evil, Mamoru Shamoraguchi, actually admitted to paying off a ghost composer who wrote all the music without credit? He unfortunately was losing his hearing for many years during his composing career, but it got so bad at Resident Evil's development that he couldn't actually do it. Which means that if you get any digital copy of the original game on the PlayStation Store nowadays, for legal reasons, you're stuck with the Shock Edition soundtrack that was a last minute replacement for legal reasons. Yep, I'm not joking, this is actually in some versions of the game, and it's the best thing I've ever heard! Where well, the game itself may not be very scary nowadays though, I gotta admit there were a couple of occasions where it still managed to get a jump out. Ah, get off that! And what Resi 1 has going for it against most other horror games of its time, is the atmosphere. And I don't mean just from the gameplay and controls working together or the visuals and music working together. It even works with the backstory and tragic notes left behind by innocent scientists and mansion grounds workers that you can read on different desks. Despite a couple of translation issues, they can be surprisingly ominous, especially when you're reading about the writer in question slowly getting infected into a mindless zombie. And this one, the itchy tasty memo? The fact it appears right after a jump scare from the cupboard behind you insinuating that you were reading the memo left by that very same zombie that's a little bit disturbing. I mean, why you don't get infected whenever you get bitten remains to be said, but I suppose this is in the same game that tells you it's too dark to see what you're picking up in this room, so the only way to see it is by lighting a candle in the other room. And why in the goddamn bloody hell is there a door with a very important item locked behind a piano that has to play a very specific piece of music to open? What if you need it in an emergency? Can you play the piece faster? And what is this poster doing in the lab? What is that? And you pick up an ink ribbon hiding underneath it. Ugh. How many inky ribbons do you think enjoyed that poster? And how about this diary here? You played poker. Okay, who with? Scott the Guard and Alias? Alias? Is he best friends with four names? And this voice acting is starting to get really distracting, not just from the deliveries, but the awkward pauses too. Wesker! Jill, so you're safe. That's what I was going to say. It's so awful that even Jill can't handle it while her friend is dying. Jill, here's my radio. You should keep it. I'm... Oh, that really was a dreadful performance. Why on earth are you here? Uh, I just had something I wanted to check. Oh my, it's Jill! Oh, Barry, it's you! But where did you... I apologize for interrupting, Jill, but I just heard that Dr. Foster got stuck in a puddle in the middle of Gloucester. Anyway, if it isn't clear enough already, Despite all of the flaws, the stupid bits, the funnier moments, and just how dated it is overall, Resident Evil I can still massively recommend. It even still set me back a good six to seven hours, and that's of pure gameplay, not including replayability. Let me tell you, the fact that this is one of the earliest 3D survival horror games, yet it manages to get so much right on this early attempt, just goes to show how good it really is. It's a testament to its quality. And it's a lot better than the new Silent Hill games and the Tinko. Especially with the Resident Evil 2 remake around the corner, give this a go. Do yourself a favor, start off Resident Evil the right way. Or get the remake on the GameCube, that's even better. Or the HD remake of the GameCube remake on the PlayStation Store or Steam or something. That's Play it! I need to wrap this up though, this video has gone on long enough. What else happens in the story itself? Well after that first zombie encounter that Wesker told us to investigate, we head back to the main hall to look for him, but he's gone. WESKER! Barry Burton then tells us to look around for more clues to where he and Chris could have gone. Help me look for him, Jill. And please let me know if you find the top of my wig. This leads us logically into the attic where a giant mutant snake is ready to eat us. Oh god, oh, oh god! And then we need to find a back door in order to escape, leading us to the guardhouse and towards a giant mutant plant blocking access to another mansion key. We take that thing down and Wesker comes back, but acting in a very sketchy way. You disappeared from the hall all of a sudden. I'm sorry, but I have my reasons. And no, not just from his voice. The key leads us to another room where the snake comes back before smacking its head into the floor, ready for good old Blurry Blurry to help us down the hall. Alone. With a rope. <laughs> that he drops. Christ's sake, what's wrong with these people? After searching around the basement for a battery to stop some water flowing in the sewer pipes, we end up in a series of nasty underground caves with tons of hunters and traps waiting for us, where we then meet up with another member of Bravo team that we were supposed to rescue. Frank Oz? The stars are going to be finished soon. He tells us there's a traitor on our team before being shot himself, but come on, it can't possibly be very Burton, even though he left us to die in the middle of a hole. We need to get to the bottom of this mystery as soon as possible. Ah! It is time, as people 
Okay, seriously, I wasn't ready for that. I very nearly died, and I'm immensely grateful I had my bazooka on me. This leads us eventually into the secret mansion basement labs, where we can view some photo slides in the offices to not only find out the names of all the bioweapons we've seen, but even see who was on the umbrella team that created the T-Virus and messed around with these experiments in the first place. <gasps> it's Wesker! He even works in a secret shady organization with his damn sunglasses! What's wrong with him? How did they get Kiefer Sutherland after some more perfect voice acting? I was looking for you. Barry. <laughs> it turns out that Wesker was blackmailing baby button to work for him the entire time by threatening his family, poor old teddy bear. And then we finally get taken into the deepest part of the lab, ready to see what Wesker and Umbrella were working on this entire time. Tyrant, the biggest, most aggressive and powerful ultra zombie you can imagine. You don't mean you're experimenting on real people. Okay, I take everything back. At the start of the game, pick Chris. Jill is stupid. Speaking of Chris, actually, after Tyrant escapes his cell and slaughters Wesker, the sleazy neon yellow head bastard, we take him down for the time being and do a little bit of side questing involving a key that Wesker dropped and using a load of items we've been collecting throughout the whole game in order to reach Chris himself, who's been locked in a prison cell. Oh, Chris! So you're okay? Yeah. Well, judging by his pants, I think he's a bit too okay. This here, though, is far from happy when we find out that... Is bleeding out on the floor as we're escaping, and his last request is for us to give his loving family a picture with a message on it addressed to Moira and Poli. Is her first name Roly? Oh, it's also worth saying that to add to the replayability, you don't just have this ending either. There's multiple endings where different people survive for both Jill and Chris's story, so that's pretty cool. But there's no time to think about that now because we are now in the elevator ready to reach the helipad and escape. And that is a face that's ready to kick the shit right back up someone's ass. I reach the top, grab a flare, set it off ready for a helicopter to come and save me, and then... Uh, the the yeah. game ends. <gasps> I have never had that ending before. Every time I played Resident Evil, I always get the ending where Jill gets to the roof of the building and then Brad the helicopter pilot comes along and drops you the rocket launcher and you fight Tyrant one last time and then you blow it to pieces before the entire lab self-destructs. Oh, screw this for a laugh. I'm going to pretend that that's the ending I got. And so with that, we get the rocket launcher, blow Tyrant to pieces, destroy the entire mansion for giving us so much shit, and that's the real ending of Resident Evil. <laughs> More like... Rubble Evil. Resident blew up. What a perfect way to end the video. Honey, ready. Okay, honey, I'll be right there. What are you doing? I'm just finishing off this script. I need to save it. We don't got any more ribbons. Oh, fuck. I'm really sorry for the terrible lighting, it's Halloween and everything. Well, it's not quite Halloween, it's the Halloween special of this channel though. But yes, the outtakes will be on in just a second for this video, so please stay tuned until the very end. But speaking of, thank you so much for staying until the very end of this video. This was a big video, so that means more to me than I can even possibly tell you. I mean, thank you. This, I don't know how you're able to stay through my annoying everything for an entire however long this video is. I just know it's going to be long, judging by the script length. But hey, special thank you to all the people on screen right now from my Patreon page who have helped support this channel and without them, this video wouldn't have been possible. And special, special thank you, just before the outtakes come on, special, special thank you to my top tier Patreon supporters for this month. Omar Matu, William Sanborn, Mitchell Reed, DC Dungeon Master, Braden Kenny, Jake Delahaye 2008, I think that's how you pronounce it, I'm sorry if I got it wrong, AD Thornton-Smith, Exopaz, Thomas Olsen, QB, Nathan Young, I Have a Portal Gun, Cyberpunk Symphony, Mills Kahai, Oblivion Rising, Matthew Hubble, Binary Code, Daniel Leon, Kirsten B, and Brandon Brandon. Great name there. Thank you so much, every single one of you. Yeah, I know. It's the Halloween special. Why am I hunched over? <laughs> being a Halloween hunchback. <laughs> the genre of that. Yes, I know. It's the Halloween special, and I'm not wearing a costume, and we haven't decorated the house. But here's the thing, right? No. 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 This is really hot in here. <laughs> it's clicking, which makes it even hotter. <laughs> okay, honey, I'll be right there. What are you doing? I am just writing the far The genre-defining survival horror classic. Now, I've been making games... I haven't been making games. What am I talking about? This game came out at a time when no one had seen anything like this, especially in an interactive medium, so yeah, it may be a very... Oh my god! Hi there! Hi, bye! Okay, honey, I'll be right there. What are you doing? I'm just finishing off this script. I'll be right down. Oh, bloody! <laughs> You'll be saying out loud to yourself. Whoa. Oh. <laughs> My jaw came off. <laughs> Chloe's coming home from school. I'm just. I'm gonna scare her. <laughs> <laughs>
My mouth moves, look. No, the no, the I jaw saw, moves. I saw when I came in, it looked brown. Stan! Stan! Oh, oh god, that went in my mouth. <laughs>